Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, we're very pleased and excited to have our two guests with us in Berkeley today <clears throat> and to be doing this program this afternoon on the new book, El Otro Modelo. Uh, this book has been a sensation in Chile, not simply the fact that it's been on the bestseller list for 12 weeks, six of them number one nonfiction. Uh, not simply because in this period it has gone through already three editions, but even more important, it has had a decisive impact on the political discussion in Chile and has raised some critical themes which our two speakers today will address. So it is a book that has proven, I think, very exciting and intellectually transforming in a Chilean context, but given the themes it deals with and the issues it raises, uh, will likely have a much broader reach across the Americas, including issues that are resonating very powerfully in the United States today. So it's a real honor to have with us uh, Javier Calso, uh, who received his PhD here at Berkeley in law and jurisprudence, and is currently a professor at the Universidad Diego Portales in Santiago, uh, and he's a professor of public law and the director of the constitutional law program. Uh, he will begin the discussion, uh, and then we will conclude with Guillermo Larraín, uh, who is a professor uh, at the University of Chile uh, and a professor of economics. Uh, both have written widely before this book, uh, but played a critical role as two of the five co-authors of El Otro Modelo. So please join me in welcoming them. Many thanks, Harley. Uh, it's, a very, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, particularly since I used to collaborate with the class for many years. And uh, it's really exciting to be back here. Okay, uh, let's. I, I would like to, we will, with Guillermo. We decided to talk for 15 minutes, minutes each, and then you know have time to exchange with you a conversation. Uh, a bit of context. Uh, as Javier, yeah, I think you might want to just pin this. Okay, it, it'll work if you pin it like that. Do you listen? It's okay. Okay. As I said in the morning, in the we had a, a, a little discussion. This book was prompted by an apparent paradox. After more than two decades of demobilization by Chile civil society, and precisely when the country was experiencing a period of solid economic growth, full employment, very little inflation, and a dramatic reduction in poverty. Poverty stands at 13%, it used to be 43 when Pinochet left power. A series of massive demonstrations swept the country, as never before in the so-called transition to democracy. Indeed, from the student movement, who mobilized demanding the end of profit in the educational system, to regional movements who went into the streets tired of Chile's extreme concentration of political and economic power, to environmental movements protesting against hydro and thermoelectrical projects. Chileans were protesting as they have never done in 22 years. As significantly, for the first time in decades, there was an explicit reaction of discontent with Chile's economic model. This was prompted by a simple but brutal fact 
for all its ex economic success, and in spite of the reduction in poverty, inequality is still incredibly high in Chile. The Gini coefficient still around, uh, around 0.54. The daily experience of inequality is particularly irritating with regard to fundamental social rights, such as education, healthcare, and pensions. In Chile's radically neoliberal privatopia, as I used to call it, people are on their own. And therefore, we have a profoundly segregated society. You get the educational quality you can afford, the health care quality you can afford, the pension you manage to save for yourself on your own. You are radically on your own. To give further examples of the hegemony of neoconservative policies in Chile, most of public transportation is public, privately delivered. The HMOs provide health care with minimal restrictions and abuse of their customers. No collective contracts among, say, a company or a university and an HMO. Instead, thousands of individual contracts in which the terms of the contract are basically imposed by little regulated HMOs. For the rest, a public health care system that works badly. Furthermore, the pension system is mostly provided by private companies. And there is almost no solidarity in the system, except from a very, very little solidarity pillar that provides little less than the minimal, minimal uh, income <coughs> wage. Lastly, in Chile, for-profit education is the rule. And therefore, Chile ranks amongst the most economically segrega segregated educational system on Earth. But there was more to it. If before 2011, the year the mobilization started, the United Nations Development Program had detected a widespread but, quote, silent discontent among Chileans, then before 2011, they tended to attribute the problems to themselves, to blame themselves. In a famous expression that the UNDP report uh, quoted, a typical Chilean would say, the country is all right, but I am not. Given the cultural hegemony of neoconservative thinking, they tended to blame themselves for the malaise they experienced. And therefore, they concluded, I must be a failure if the country is well, but I am not. Well, in 2011, a series of scandals by market abuses perpetrated by large pharmaceuticals and retail companies made clear that it was not that most Chileans were a failure. The problem was the system itself, not individual performance. Thus, hundreds of thousands of Chileans met with others who were similarly situated and started to demand profound change in the social and economic model, and also the constitutional model, that for the first time was seen by millions of Chileans as an obstacle to achieve profound change in the social and economic spheres. So on the eve of this mobilization, with three other colleagues who are not here, two jurists, two economists, and one sociologist, we decided to do an interdisciplinary work that was collective. And that's something that performatively wanted to reposition the importance of the coll collective against the individualistic. And we set to elaborate a more uh, developed diagnostic of what, what was going on and found that Chile's economic model was part of a larger model with a constitutional, a political, and cultural dimensions, which help, had helped to maintain a rather ex extreme piece 
of economic neoliberalism. I want to emphasize the radical nature of Chile's econom uh, economic system. As we put it in the introductory chapter of the book, Chile's model is comprised of three fundamental elements. First, a constitutional model. A constitutional model imposed by the military dictatorship in 1980, and even though has been subsequently modified, <coughs> had been modified only to the degree that the political inheritors of the dictatorship had accepted to be changed. This constitutional model ensures that the heirs of the dictatorship, with merely three-sevenths of only one chamber, can block any significant reform in Chile's most important legislation. For example, the legislation that regulates education in the country. This due to the so-called organic constitutional laws, which required fourth-seventh of Congress to pass any amendment to legislation covering any relevant issue in Chile. Second, a political model. This was the second leg of the Ch Chile's current model. The so-called politics of consensus, as, or as it is known in Chile, democracia de los acuerdos. When we scrutinized these politics of consensus, we soon realized that this was not the free and equal agreement reached by political groups uh, which stand on an equal standing, but the gracious concessions made by the political heirs of the military regime, thanks to a playing field that was basically a uh, unfair. I mean, the, the way Fernando Atria, who is one of the co-authors and it's launching a book just on the Constitution, is called the, Consti the La Constitución Tramposa. The unfair, the unfair, but more than unfair, no. it's tricky. tricky. So the idea is like, as the brain of Pinochet's Constitution, Jaime Guzmán put it, and he was quite explicit about it, the idea is the following. No matter who our adversaries were, he said, they would be constrained to do exactly as we would like them to do. He put this in writing. It's amazing how people can be so candid. And the third uh, was the cultural hegemony that neoconservative thinking achieved within the elites, but also within regular Chileans. This made part of the common sense that, say, Chile's public television had to compete under the same rules as any private TV. So therefore, the quality of, or the, even the public nature of the national Chilean TV became, became completely absent. You cannot distinguish Chile's national TV from a privately owned a network by seeing it. Uh, also, if we, we the cultural, uh, uh, the profound cultural penetration of neoconservative economics made even the designers of the supposedly upgrading of the Chile at Santiago's transportation system to regard the introduction of even one public company to do public transportation as ideologically biased. So the socialist government of Ricardo Lagos thought, I mean, its uh, bureaucrats thought that it would be too lefty to have what it's the common sense in all capitalist nations on earth, including the US, where public transportation is served by public companies. So what's to be done? In the book, we start with the political and constitutional, because that's the key to change any of the other issues. And that uh, basically would allow, we claim, to reconceptualize citizenship, 
social rights under and the provision of these rights by either public or private companies, but in the case of private companies, under what we call the regime of the public. Basically, it's the idea that if any private entity is providing fundamental social rights like education, healthcare, or even the administration of pension funds, they shall be regulated by a special kind of legislation that make them different than any other private company pursuing only private goals. So with that, I would leave Guillermo to continue with the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, <coughs> Javier. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me being here. It's the first time I'm in Berkeley, so uh, it's a great honor uh, to discuss this book uh, that we in which we, we worked for four years, basically, with Javier and our three co-authors. Uh, so I, I will explain to you what we have done in, three er in two areas of the book. Uh, Javier discussed, basically, the, what we did in the political area. Uh, and um, I will discuss what we did in the social and in the economic uh, areas. And I said we because uh, no, no, uh, in spite of the fact that we come from different areas, two economists, uh, two lawyers, and one sociologist, we wrote this book uh, with 50 fingers, as we said. We wrote the book all together. And, and that's a very important uh, methodological issue that I believe deserves also uh, a discussion on itself. Uh, so let me start by the, so, uh, by the social issue. Probably one of the most well-known uh, uh, elements of the, of the uh, Pinochet heritage is the reforms uh, dictatorship did on the social uh, issues. And among them, the most well-known of all is the pension reform. So the pension reform, as you may eventually know, uh, consists in that any Chilean has an individual account in which uh, uh, every month uh, they contribute to a personal account. Uh, those savings are managed by a private company and uh, those savings accumulate over time and are used to finance basically an annuity at the end uh, of, of his life, of his, of his working life. Now, what's the ideology behind it, it, it is well, uh, well uh, conceptualized uh, in the title of a book by a right-wing uh, think tank uh, called Libertad y Desarrollo, and the title of the book is Private Solutions to Public Problems, which is quite appealing that you could, if, if you could eventually fi find private solutions to public problems, would be great. You could eventually freeze, so, so, so free, uh, free uh, uh, public resources to uh, to other uses, uh, and eventually solve the, the the public problems. So, in principle, we not we do not necessarily we disagree with uh, that concept, uh, in the sense that we don't disagree with the idea of having private agents participating in solving public problems. So that's not the point. The point is that the way uh, this was actually done is creating uh, market uh, structures for solving those uh, public problems. Uh, and uh, we have accumulated a lot of evidence uh, as of today that market structures uh, tend to create in some areas uh, some problems. Uh, one of them has been uh, identified by, for instance, in this same university, George Akerlof, uh, when he talked about uh, the, the, the harm that incentives create on identities. Uh, Michael Sandel in Harvard uh, talks about the harm that markets create on certain inherent characteristics of certain goods. Well, what we say is that when you have uh, some uh, social rights, if the provision of that social rights is organized uh, through market structures, 
then you have a conflict. Uh, and the conflict is because a market structure, but the same, uh, but the same uh, idea of a market, will create a segregated provision of that of that uh, of that service or that good, uh, which will be conflictual with the idea of a social good or or a social right that, by its same nature, uh, uh, it is. Uh, it imposes some idea of egalitarian provision in some, in some sense. And we understand that this is one uh, very critical uh, uh, um, inconsistency that it is uh, conflicting the Chilean society uh, nowadays. So the market solution, uh, which is, uh, is not a private solution to the public problem, but a privatization of the problem, which is quite different. Uh, so indeed, the pension ceased to be a public problem. It is a privatization of the problem. So in Chile today, we don't have a social security. Basically, we have my pension, we have my health problem, my pension problem is my old age problem, my education problem. And therefore, uh, we have uh, that uh, situation uh, today. So we developed uh, the idea of the regime of the publicness or the regime of the public sphere in order to advance forward. Uh, and how, uh, how is this? The traditional approach uh, was that, uh, imagine that you have uh, the traditional provider of, uh, uh, of a given service was a state, uh, the agent was a state provider that was, uh, that was, uh, that operated under a public regime that was fulfilling a public function and the counterpart was a citizen. On the other side of the coin, on the other side of the, of the, of, of uh, public life, you had a private agent who was functioning under the private regime and uh, was uh, uh, fulfilling a private function, and the counterpart was a client. So you had basically public education, uh, and you had a, and, and so citizens were, uh, were to public schools, and any one of us was to any restaurant. And you were a client to a restaurant, but a citizen to a public school. So the, the, the Pinochet uh, uh, reform uh, consisted in saying that the private agent could eventually fulfill a public function. But the tricky thing was that the public function could be, uh, could be uh, uh, undertaken under, under the private regime the private regime, meaning the market structure. And this is inconsistent. So what we say is that the real, the real important thing is not the agent. The real important thing is the function. So is you, if you are fulfilling a public function in the economy, in society, you must be uh, doing this under a public regime. And the book describes quite a lot uh, in detail the uh, structure of that public uh, regime, which is the basic idea, and we can discuss it later on if you want more, what, uh, of the public regime is that uh, you face your provider as a citizen. And the citizen, with respect to the provider, has a right. When you go to a restaurant, you don't have a right. You have a right only if you have the money to buy uh, what you want to eat. If you don't have the money, you don't have the right. Whereas in the public regime, what we say is, is, is that if you are a citizen, you have the right, irrespectively if you have the money or not to pay for it. That's what we say is the way to move forward in terms of uh, the provision of social 
of social rights. Now, this is a very uh, difficult question. Uh, it has a lot of nuances. And therefore, we try to look for a specific case. And we uh, discuss the issue of the public education, uh, in the case of, in particular, school education. And you know the way we do it today, the, the solution we, we do today is that today, eligible families, the way the, 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 the public uh, solution uh, for education works today is that eligible families, not all families, eligible families today receive a voucher. Uh, and with that voucher, they buy the type and amount of education they desire. So they have a voucher, and on top of which, they pay whatever education they want. So, in, so this end up having some basic education provided by the state, and on top of what, on top of which you have a whole and continuum of different providers of education and different uh, 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 amounts of uh, uh, cost of education from the, from the uh, uh, free education provided by the state, very poor quality, to the top uh, and most expensive education, uh, which is from with relative good education um, uh, provided by uh, the most expensive private uh, providers. Market signals are then given to help parents to choose the school bringing market discipline. So the idea is to create a market, so parents must choose these uh, edu education, these schools. So which kind of uh, market uh, uh, market signals? Where well, market signals are given by tests. So there are tests in fourth grade, eighth grade, uh, tenth grade. So what's uh, what's the outcome? Segregation. You have basic. Uh, 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 each each family pays the the whatever they can to choose the, to, to having their their kids in the in the in the in the in the they 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 they, they, they pay as much as they can uh, in order to have their, their their kids in the in the best school they can so the 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 school system replicates the segregation of the families in in society and the quality is very poor because the curriculum tends to to be uh, to be uh, 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 to be in line with the test to to be uh, 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 to, to those tests that will be used as a market signal for uh, for families. So, what is the regime for the public sphere? What we say is that educational projects should be non for profit. There should be, uh, of course, uh, freedom to choose uh, the educational project, so we don't deny this. There is a long history in Chile that uh, providers uh, are, uh, choose their own uh, educational, educational uh, uh, project. We do not uh, deny this. This is fine. But we translate the whole freedom to choose the type of education to the families. Today, this belongs to the, to the schools. Uh, and we give the voucher, the unique voucher, financed by the state to the family. There is a unique price uh, that it is received by the families, and this is the only price with, with, with which education is, is, is financed. And we give uh, a rough shapely algorithm to match supply and demand. Well, I took a bit too much time in explaining this. Sorry, it's a bit too much. Uh, sorry. I, I, I should have eventually uh, spent less on that. Let me just give in one minute uh, what we say on the economic side. The problem on the economic side is the following. Uh, we have uh, uh, developed our country with the idea that uh, market has the power to ar allocate efficiently resources uh, and this is wrong. Uh, in the last couple of years, we have been able, uh, I mean, our economy has been concentrated its, uh, its exports on, on minerals uh, away uh, from, uh, from other areas. Uh, we, have been, we have not been able to uh, improve our, uh, in, uh, our, uh, our 
uh, inequality uh, and we have not been able to improve our productivity records. We understand that all these issues are related uh, and uh, we uh, develop an idea that uh, all this has to do with the lack of an industrial policy. And if we have time and if it is of interest for you, we can discuss this. Great. Now we will uh, have any questions or comments. Uh, yes. I'm a, I'm a history major, and thank you so much for the opportunity to give this presentation. I was wondering, with such a big picture that you present, what is, is there a light at the end of the tunnel for children? What are the steps that need to be taken then? And are they visible? Because it seems like if we, if there is no interest at the very top, it seems like people are not empowered to be able to bring about the change that you are to be presenting your book. Should, should we, we start Shall we take? Sure, you, or would you want me to take several questions? No, let's, let's go. Okay. Step step. Okay. Uh, if I may, uh, well, you know, hunger is no bread, as uh, I agree. The, uh, we are trying to make uh, an assessment of what the situation is. We are not saying it's going to be easy, the way out. Basically, there are reasons. I mean, the, the situation was worse before 2011. There was sort of a, an anomia. You know, people were feeling a malaise, but individually, Chileans, there were reports of having a, a lot of the population under huge stress, and this was very comprehensible. And basically, you were so on your own that if you didn't have the money, you could not, and you lost, or you lost your job, you know, your pension would be suffering, your health care would be suffering, your the education of your children. So there was a lot, a lot <coughs> of stress, but lived in the solitude of one's own house. And, 2011 was really an explosion of, uh, you know, realizing that you know the emperor had no clothes. I mean, people realized, you know, there are millions of us suffering this uncertainty, fragility, and and this was uh, liberating in some ways. And what's interesting, I think, is that over the last two years, the pressure ha had kept going. I mean, this was not something that happened only. You know, a couple of months and then disappear. The students kept the pressure. Other social movements have been keeping the pressure, and you know, eight of the nine presidential candidates are supporting a new constitution. The position of the political inheritors of the dictatorship is to basically barricade themselves under the constitution as it is. So. It, there is an open question of what will happen when, you know, eventually the, it's very likely that the new government would be led uh, by uh, President Bachelet, who is running again, and she has uh, put the new constitution as one of her, the three pillars of the new uh, government. And, but in Chile, the media is own, uh, the, the one that creates common sense, the established media, the mainstream media, is still a very neoconservative, in bed, I mean, and supportive of all this. So, I, I I can anticipate a clash between the media, the right wing, to any move to change the constitution. But on the other hand, there is a lot of I prefer this situation of movement to the sad hegemony of a very ideological situation before 2011. So we're not saying that it's going to be easy, but I think it's a very exciting time in Chile's history. But let me, I didn't put my microphone before, <laughs> which is not bad because I was terrible in my presentation was <laughs> really bad <laughs> the first time. So I will try to be better now. Uh, no, let me, let me say the following. The first, <clears throat> one of the, thesis of this book is that, which has been quite conflicting in, in Chile, is that we understand that the society has changed significantly. Now, this is conflicting because of what Javier expressed in terms of the freezing political situation. 
the Constitution does not allow for our political uh, uh, institutions to evolve as society is evolving. Now, we understand this as a potential clash, and we need to avoid this. So, this has been, to some extent, uh, uh, been happening already, uh, gradually over time. It happened in 2006 with the students. It happened much more significantly in 2011. We hope that we shall be wise enough to avoid another uh, clash that may be even stronger than the one in 2011. So I hope that we shall be wise enough, including the right and including the media, to avoid uh, uh, another event such as 2011. Let me, let, me, let me tell you this. In 2011, at one point in time, we had one million, in a country of 17 million, we had one million people in the street. That's, that's about 40, no, I mean, I mean eight, uh, 30 million in the streets of the US. I mean, what would you do with that? Uh, so that's, that's, that's really uh, impressive. So uh, there is, I believe there is, uh, there is uh, some conscience growing that you need to move forward. Uh, if you look at the polls uh, in, in last week, uh, President Bachelet is front runner. I don't know exactly if these polls are right or not, but she's front runner with 33%. Then the right wing uh, candidate is second with 21, I think. Yeah, more or less. But the third one is a populist right wing candidate, Mr. Parisi. So, what happens if you don't really uh, uh, make significant political reforms? If the political system is not uh, able to uh, to channel we'll say channel to channel all these social needs well we shall be left on the hands of the populists they are there they are the third they are 15 percent now so that's the future Yes. What are the basic changes that the proposed constitution would make? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, basically, there are two sets of reforms. The first one is to democratize the constitution. The constitution as it is right now does not allow democracy to work. You, you want me to use, use the other one? The other one is yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. So we lost. We lost the previous half an hour. We will start again. So, as do you listen? Okay. As I was saying, the first set of reforms merely try to do what any constitutional democracy has, which is a system in which the democratic majority can express itself in a democratic majority in Congress, for instance, which doesn't happen. And there are many other issues that I can go into detail, but I would like to say that this is the crucial one. We basically have a system in which the minority has a, veto, a complete veto power. And it's not any minority. It's the inheritor of the worst dictatorship Chile ever had. So it's a criminal dictatorship, and a very ideological one, one that he imposed an extreme version of neoconservative economics. So we, if we can do that, if we can democratize our society, it's, we, at least in our position in the book, is that let's have a deliberation of what rules of the game we want to, for the Constitution to set. We, we of course, have some you know, preferences. But the critical issue is to have a deliberative democracy. With that, we'll be happy. Yes. Uh, I have two questions for each of you. Um, so the, the first one is in, in the book. Uh, you talk 
article about public expenditure and how to redesign some public policies. Uh, but I would like you to ask if you can expand a little bit on public finance and taxation. So to which extent you see that the tax system needs to go from a one focused on efficiency and just uh, collecting a lot of money using indirect taxation to one that focuses more, more on, on kind of affect the exposed in coefficient, for example, or kind of improve equality. And uh, my other question, probably more for you, Javier, is uh, how do you see judiciary place in, in this balance? Because in the book, also, there is a lot of, of argument about uh, legislation and constitution, but less about how, and I don't have the screen, how is the judiciary right now? And I, uh, Recently, I already published a, a book, kind of digging a trench, starting to criticize the judiciary for being too uh, liberal and to be too detached from rules. So, how did you see the judiciary? Do you think they're going to tag along to the change? They're going to uh, go with the Vatican already in the, in, in the trench they are digging? If you can expand on that too, please. <coughs> Well, with respect to to, to uh, public expenditure and, and taxes, uh, well, you know, I, I will talk basic about uh, on public expenditure. The whole discussion we are having now is to what extent should we uh, should we have universal uh, prestaciones? How you say that? Basically, entitlements. Entitlements. Uh, but but I will, let me skip that point. Let me go to, to taxes. Uh, I mean, I mean, among the emerging emerging markets, I would say uh, Chile probably is one of the is one of those countries which probably has one of the most sophisticated tax systems. That is. That is, is, is really clear. Now, uh, it, it comes from uh, a situation where, um, uh, I mean, its tax system is based on consumption. Uh, as all uh, underdeveloped countries. So, uh, I mean, part of the, of the, of the, of the health of the public sector in Chile uh, is due to the fact that we introduced uh, value-added taxes quite early on in the 70s. Uh, now, is it efficient or not? Probably yes. But as long as uh, the country has, has become wealthier, uh, the, the issues of uh, horizontal and uh, and vertical uh, uh, justice becomes more relevant. People becomes more aware of uh, of uh, the the inequities of of the of the of the tax system, uh, and and I believe that's that's part of the problems we are having now. Um, for those of you that uh, that that does not do not know this, um, about uh, I don't know exactly the numbers, uh, all of them, but today something like uh, sixty percent of our tax revenues come from uh, consumption-based uh, 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 taxes, and forty percent from from uh, income-based taxes, uh, and on the income base, so. For poor people, let's say, and poor people, I mean, eighty percent of the population. I mean, those who who do not pay income tax, uh, uh, they they basically do not save, uh, and therefore all their income is consumption, uh, and therefore uh, their value added tax, their tax on consumption, uh, is basically a tax on their income. Whereas uh, people on uh, with high income, they they have uh, their their tax on consumption. Given that consumption is much smaller than their income, 
uh, they, they, they pay much uh, a smaller fraction on the, the value added tax as a share of their income is much smaller for wealthy people. Now, that would be no problem if they would pay their income tax. But their income tax, in particular for the very high income people, is deferred because there, is, there are uh, at least two uh, incentives for savings, uh, which basically postpone the, 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 the income taxes for very wealthy people. So my impression is that these two issues are the ones that will have to be solved now. Now, my uh, understanding is that these two issues are part of the, are in the priorities of Madame Bachelet's uh, 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 program. They are part of the, of, the, of the priorities of the new government. And the, the uh, if you want, to, not the right, but at least the entrepreneurial community is relatively in favor of it. They understand that they do not belong to the 21st century Chile, that they fulfilled a role at some point in time in which the country needed some incentives for savings because the country was isolated uh, from the financial, uh, from the financial uh, service, uh, 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 international financial uh, 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 capital markets. Today, this is not the case. We don't have any trouble in financing any kind of investment, uh, and therefore, we don't need that kind of incentives any longer. So, um, I believe that those two issues will change now. Very quickly. Very quickly on the judiciary. I would say that if you see Latin America as a whole, over the last two decades, there was this hope among progressives of judicially triggered social and economic transformation, particularly in Colombia, Costa Rica, and Argentina. In some of these countries, the Latin American left eventually was disappointed of the hope that you, know, you could get emancipation or pro social transformation by judicial fiat. So they ended up destroying the dependence of the courts, as in Venezuela or, or in Korea, in the case of Ecuador. In Bolivia, through a more sophisticated way, through the popular election of all high court judges. So you don't have a, basically you replicate in the judiciary the majorities that you get into the other branches. In Chile, the situation is mixed. We have the old guard of judges are mostly conservative and formalistic. And there is a young generation of judges who are embedded on, in the old hope of the 90s on judiciary trigger social emancipation. And very skeptical of profound social transformation, economic transformation through judges. And in Chile, more concern of the judges actually blocking calls for a new constitution. So I would expect them to let the political democratic process go. Uh, today, I would not place much hope in you know, the role that the courts can have. Even, this is very technical, but even for those who are here to John Hart Ely's idea or Habermas idea of the courts as being activists only <coughs> perfecting the democratic process. That would be a role for the Constitutional Court in Chile, but the court would never do that. For instance, the court could declare that the supermajority legislation, these organic constitutional laws, go against Article 4 of the Chilean Constitution that claims that Chile is a democratic republic or they could decide that the binominal electoral system that tends to produce a tie in Congress, which only serves the status quo, also is uh, something that goes against the, the Article 4. But they will never do that. So my hope at this moment is that they do not block President Bachelet's, for instance, decree calling for a referendum for a new constitution, something that they might well do. But that's what I would answer to your question. Yes. Um, two things. One is you raised a concern about the, the populace at 15%. I don't quite understand that, why that seemed such a concern in terms of 
who they are. So if you could explain a little bit about that one thing. And secondly, in your book, um, I understand the Chilean context and the importance of getting sort of citizen service back to the public realm of regulation. But you get into the area of the other, say, productive and commercial relations in the economy. In other words, are you looking at other models of economics besides you know, capitalism that's been developed in Chile over the last period of time? <laughs> well, um, well, this populist guy, um, he's very young. It's the first time he's in politics. He used to be the vice dean. Vice dean, you say? Vice dean, yeah. yeah. Of my faculty, <laughs> so I know him. I know him well. Uh, and uh, he said once, I mean, not so long ago, six months ago or so, he said, the time of political parties is over. It's time to talk directly to the people. What he's saying is that political parties are unable to channel the, the, the needs of the people, which is basically eventually true because political parties, given that the, 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 the freeze of this, of, of the, of the or, or given the rules of the game in which the political parties actually play, they are unable to solve many problems. So he's selling the idea that he will be able to do, to, to solve those problems, which is totally false, is untrue what he's saying. But he may eventually win an election uh, lying which may eventually be the case. So I'm not sure whether I, 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 I answer your question, but he's already with 15% of support. He has a TV program. He's saying uh, that he's able to solve many of these uh, problems, uh, basically uh, with, with very simple solutions. He's a very good at communicating easy solutions uh, and talking directly to the people. Uh, I, I, I understand this is very, very, very complex. Now, the second point, I like it very much. One, uh, one because this is not in the book, but I understand your, your point and I like it because it's, it should be one extension. We, if, if I understand your question, the whole legal structure of Chile promotes one form of legal organization of private entities, if I understand your point, which is the Sociedad Anonima or public... Com public, public companies. Yeah. Not the ones that have stock exchange, you can buy Corporation. stocks. Corporations. Public Corporations. Companies. And uh, well, this is not the only way of uh, of organizing private activities. Uh, I have been advising in the last uh, in the last uh, year uh, some cooperatives, uh, which were totally unknown for me. Uh, and I believe there is a lot of things that can be done in the cooperative world. Uh, and uh, and this is not in the book. I have not even discussed this with my co-authors, <laughs> but uh, I understand that the proper role of the state within the logic of the of the of the of the of the public uh, of the uh, of the public sphere uh, regime uh, is to allow the private sector to organize in the way that. They want to be organized. The state should not impose any barrier to, for the private sector to organize the way they want. Today, in Chile, this is the case. Uh, we impose barriers for uh, organizations that are not uh, profit-making entities and for organizations that do not end up being uh, corporations. And this is not uh, healthy, I think. Uh, we need to, 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 to give, uh, give uh, tools for, the, for a vigorous civil society, and this means giving 
civil society a lot of instruments that are not eventually there today. Just to address the same issue, because what we did do in the book was to address the fact that Chile is entirely dependent on the price of a commodity. Chile is an export economy, and still, almost 50% of our exports are copper. So if the price of that commodity when it goes down, Chile is in deep trouble, and, and it's not reasonable to be dependent on one com the price of one commodity. So, and if you add to that, that the growth in the productivity per worker per hour was basically zero over the last 10 years. You know, there is some debate, but we have a problem. We have a real problem. The productivity per capita is really low. It has a lot to do with the kind of education system we have, but also with, you know, the fact that we are exporting, uh, we are very organized as a country, fiscally responsible, all that. And that, nobody is questioning that. But the exposure to you know, the, the contingencies of the price of a commodity really made, in Chile was a bad word to talk about industrial policy. So we have a big chapter on the new industrial policy, the, a way they can, uh, the statement is even stronger. Uh, the statement is that there is very little evidence of countries that have really gotten developed without some sort of industrial policy. Just letting you know, the forces of the free market allocate resources. And on, on populism, just a word. It, it's an old tradition in Latin America. And it hasn't worked really well. I mean, it's basically tend to be messianic figures that have a problem of this succession that tend to, you know, are very tempted to remain in power, trans I mean, violating the constitutional rules of the game, and typically they have not been able to leave something after they are, their biological time is over. So, in a way, populism has been tried, has not been a very good news, but I think that, uh, touching on what Harley was saying at the very beginning of this session, I have been thinking about one issue that I think is of relevance for all democracies, not, not just Latin American democracies, is how much inequality can a constitutional democracy endure? I mean, that's a question. You see it in the way, you know, private financing of elections distort the... I mean, it's... You, other thing that I think is important is, it's very important to see other experiences, comparative experiences. The Germans have a tradition of financing politics heavily because they think part political parties are important. So the political process in Germany has nothing to do with the US when it comes to the issue of money in politics. So in the case, my impression is that the concentration of political power in Chile due to the, the we have the 1% issue, as I, I, basically it's the same. And the legitimacy of the democratic process is in trouble. The young people don't believe in democracy. They think it's a scam. So how, how long does a democratic system last if the people, particularly younger generations, do not believe in it? Because they see the you know, perverse role of money in politics, for instance. So I think that there are issues that are relevant to any constitutional democracy. Yes. I would imagine here that a book by economists and lawyers would be a seller. <laughs> so, I'm curious who is reading your book and to what extent has it become an issue, the book itself, in the election? And also, then, to what extent even should Bachelet win and campaign on the need to change the Constitution? To what extent is the military power so entrenched? that despite whatever large majority or plurality that could come about, is there any reasonable chance that the Constitution really will be modified? Well, OK. Uh, wonderful question. Uh, just, I do not know why it has been a vessel. I, I, I just think that there was a lot of 
a sense of that, you know, millions, a million people were in the streets saying, we do not like this. And the book, you know, we humbly tried to articulate that and say, maybe there is another way to do things. So, and I, I, maybe that's something that, that helped becoming a resource for <laughs> the event. As we are close to Bachelet, and you know, all five of us are think that she has, in a way, I think she did a more conservative government than she, she should have, as Lagos did. And they were, you know, the children of, the, of their time. They, they really, they, it's very hard for me to convey how strong the hegemony of neoliberalism was at the time. I, I can report uh, of a very savvy economist who was Minister of Finance, or the first government. And because he's so intellectually honest, he said, you know, we asked him, why were you so neoconservative? It was not necessary. He said, you know, we, we really thought that that was the way to go. You know, it was a very precarious transition. Military was still there. So, and we started being hostile by accepting it, and you know, all of a sudden, half of us were convinced that that was the way to go. You know, the economy was growing, so basically, poverty was decreasing. I mean, that's something important to now that we have only 13 percent of poverty and not 43. Inequality became an issue. I mean, it was an issue for many of us personally, but not socially. Now it's a public issue. But your question on the military. The military is still at heart with Pinochet. I'm convinced. Basically, it was, you know, the, their government. And so, but, it's, but it's, the military will not actively do a coup that you don't, you don't have coups anymore. You have these soft coups in Latin America, you know. This, <laughs> It, it, you cannot put tanks and, and bomb, bomb the government house anymore. But they do exert pressure. So I think, in a way, the most important issue is to make the right wing get divided about the constitutional issue. If we can find even a little group of truly democratic uh, right wing uh, parliamentarians, that would make a huge difference. The military would not, you know, go in to stop that, a, pro a constitutional process. Chile is an orderly country. I mean, one of, one of the things that is really sad about the way the right-wing media is portraying the call for a constitutional assembly is that, oh, you're going the Venezuela's path. It all started, Chavez started with a constitutional assembly. So that's what you want us. And Chile had a institutional, you know, context which is so different than Venezuela's. In, the, in terms of the rule of law, and and and, and I, I think that, uh, and the very fact that the army is so right wing, it would it prevent, you know, anything like what happened in Venezuela to happen. But but you have a, a you, put your finger on exactly the right, most com one of the most complicated issues, we face. I believe Chileans love politics. They love politics. So uh, I don't know exactly who's reading the book, but many people are reading the book, and from many areas. Now, <clears throat> when I say many people, it's not a million people. I mean, when we say this is a best-selling, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, a couple of thousand. It's not that much. <laughs> <laughs> now, no, don't say the number because uh, I would, let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about shares, uh, percentages, because uh, we made a calculation. Uh, James Robinson, uh, the author with Darren Asimov of. Uh, of the best-selling book, Why Nations Fail, uh, was in Santiago, I mean, two or three months ago. And we made the calculations, how many books have they sold in English? Uh, and we made the calculation, uh, how much have they sold in, in English and how much have we sold in Spanish? And we have sold more. <laughs> and, that's the, and that's why we are successful. But of course, it's not much in absolute numbers. Uh, 
but uh, it's it's quite widespread. And and the interesting thing is that there is a lot of uh, reaction from the people. Uh, almost every week, there is someone writing something in favor or against uh, in the newspaper. Uh, this week, there was very a very well known journalist writing. I mean, the exact term, I could not really say it in front of a camera, but, <laughs> but it's a very bad word uh, about his writing on our book, but it's very bad. But anyway, um, and there have been very good uh, things. There have been TV programs related to it. So uh, uh, I don't know why. I mean, I, mean I, I, I believe that there was something on the air that needed to be needed to be uh, needed to be written, and for some reason it was written here. Uh, it was a little bit of a chance, a little bit of uh, something. So that's it. Now, now, with respect to the military, one one last one point. I, I'm 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 not uh, as Javier. I'm not really concerned about that because uh, I believe that the military military were, at the end of the day, are a bit angry with the right. Because the right uh, took the best without almost any cost. They had all the good things uh, of dictatorship without any cost. They, uh, on the contrary, they, they got all the cost, uh, and, uh, and most of them, without really any benefit. So they, I'm not sure that they would do exactly the same uh, uh, as well. Yes. Uh, I hear you you're talking about an indictment of the current system. But I didn't really hear what the ultra modelo is. And, uh, uh, and particularly in the economic sphere. And then I, and the subsidiary question, is there any, any discussion of the end of years in terms of the ultra modelo? That's a very good question because we, let's put this into context, we discuss about the title of the book. If you live in a country in which 7% of the labor force has collective bargaining, and it used to be 50% when Salvador Allende was president. Uh, that would also be the United States. <laughs> yeah, sure. But in Denmark is 90%. Right. Mm -hmm. So Denmark, 90%, Chile, 8%, 9%. In labor, in, strikes are almost unheard of in the private sector in Chile. The only ones who go into strikes are the ones who are illegal, <laughs> who are forbidden to do it. They're in the public sector. So that that's one issue. A country in which South Korea, not North Korea, South Korea has 100% of the schools are public. In Chile, are the worst and perhaps 25%. Even in the US, almost 90% of high schools are public, US. In Chile, is, as I said, less than a third. So you start, social security basically doesn't exist as a concept, except for the military. That's the only thing that Pinochet did that was smart. <laughs> we, from out of our pocket, as contributing, you know, taxpaying people, we pay the pensions of the military. So they retire very young, and they have you know, a very comfortable pension paid by all Chileans. But we basically don't have social security in the meaning that it's a problem for the collective. We don't have industrial policy whatsoever. I mean, basically, the market is the one that by its own. So, well, it is, in that particular sense, it's another, it's a different model. It's a model, the, the notion of citizenship in Chile is very devoid of any meaning. So, yeah, if you say Denmark is a different model than Chile, yes, we, well, that's where we want to go. We're, we're not that, I mean, it's not that innovative, it's just, you know, a kind of modern social democratic uh, Horizon, but for Chile, it would be an immense change. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I would not. Um, we're not saying that we shall start walking on the walls. Uh, this is not such a change. It's much less than that. But it's nevertheless a change. Now, the change, you should probably measure it as against how much opposition there is to it. If there is no opposition, then it means that there is no such a change. And to this, there is a lot of opposition. There is a lot of opposition on political grounds. There will be a lot of opposition on social issues because uh, many people would not agree with the idea that, first of all, many people would not agree that there are social rights, social rights on the first place. Second one, many people would not agree that social rights should be organized or provided by non-profit entities according more or less to the ideas that I said. Uh, and, and that would create a lot of opposition. Um, and many people would not agree with the idea that we should implement industrial policies, even though it's industrial policies not the way we did it in the past, but new industrial policies the way we do it here. So there would be opposition to this. And therefore, it's, it is a new, a new, a new, a new model. Now, it's a new model for us, but eventually not for you, because you have all of, all of this. You have industrial policy. You have some kind, a bit less you than Denmark, but you have some kind of universal entitlements here and there. Uh, you have more organized labor than we have. You have more everything than we have. So for you, it's not such a big deal. But for us, it is. You have more democratic uh, debate than we have. So I understand that uh, seen from here, or seen from Europe, it doesn't seem to be such a big thing. And uh, I did the same speech in, uh, at the OECD in, uh, in July, and they, they say exactly the same. What, 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 the big, what the other model it is? They said that we were creating a new kind of communist thing, and, and it's not that. I mean, it's, it's more citizenship, more democratic uh, system, uh, a new role for the state, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not that we shall have uh, springtime in autumn or, or, <laughs> or, or holidays in winter. <laughs> it's, it's a bit more of the same. Well, unfortunately, we're about out of time. I have the sense we were just beginning the discussion. Uh, I want to thank Guillermo Larín for being here with us, uh, his first time in Berkeley. And I want to welcome back Javier Causo, uh, whom we are very glad to see again on campus and at the center. And we very much look forward to continuing uh, a debate and discussion on the issues raised here uh, and on other areas as, th as this discussion unfolds. So thank you.